with so many podcasts out there, shows can get lost in the shuffle. That's why we implore you to check out Too Many Captains. You can find us at a moviepodcast.com. Five unique takes on Hollywood movies and culture. Find us on Twitter at It's a Film Podcast. Check our intellectual deep dives into theatrical films. Find us on Instagram at Too Many Captains Productions. Unique takes on soundtracks. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Too Many Captains Productions. Find us at a moviepodcast.com on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. And now, here comes a new episode of Collateral Cinema. I'm Bo Maddox. I'm Robert Oregon. And I'm Ashley Chancellor. And this is Collateral Cinema. <laughs> Welcome to Collateral Cinema, the only movie podcast that matters, where we focus on good movies, bad movies, and everything else in between in the world of cinema. We're podcasting straight from somewhere in South Texas, and yes, my friends, we are a 420-friendly podcast. So whatever you have, be it dabs, blunts, bongs, or joints, smoke it if you've got it. And welcome to a slightly more irreverent episode of Collateral Cinema, needless to say. After the whole travesty that was old fashioned, we're kind <laughs> of, <laughs> yeah, it was that bad. We kind of needed a little bit of respite. So we're doing Hot Tub Time Machine from 2010, starring Rob Corddry, John Cusack, Craig Robinson, and who's the other kid in this? Y'all know? Um, Something Duke, I forgot his name. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Clark, Clark Duke. Yeah. Clark Duke? Yeah. All right, straight up. And Robert, this is your choice for this podcast. Why don't you go ahead and tell everybody why you brought this movie to the show? Kind of want to recreate what we had with Fanboys maybe one more time. Yeah, this kind of <laughs> this, this does kind of have a little bit of a Fanboys feel to it, kind of, especially with the humor and everything. There you go. But I kind of thought that it was a, a lot of fun. I mean, it's not anything that you really need to, you know think too deeply about mm. i mean some of the time travel tropes are done rather well and we'll get into that here in a little bit but yeah this movie is actually pretty cool i thought you know yeah. it was it was a welcome you know change from what we are normally accustomed to here on collateral cinema it and was fun and, it, and, and not heavy and sometimes you need a little bit of, of just fun and not heavy yeah we don't we don't have too much of that really we need more of this <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's a party movie through and through. Nothing you really take too seriously, but it was fun. And I also think that it's appropriate. You know, we're kind of getting the band back together all under one roof again. It, it, it feels thematically relevant. Definitely. We are all finally in the same room together after several months due to the coronavirus pandemic. We need to go get our singer, Dakota. Yeah, we do. We need to get our Vince Neil. Dakota's we, we our do. Vince Neil. He's our, our well. frontman. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> yeah, Dakota, if you're listening to this right now, yeah, you're the Vince Neil of this outfit. Yeah, the front, yes, you're the, the front Vince Neil of this outfit, which be. is relevant to this movie because Motley Crue is kind of a prominent recurring theme throughout this movie, right, Robert? Yeah, especially with the the music and uh, when he's listening to it in the in the car. I mean, we all grew up with these songs, man. Especially our, my dad's music. Or yeah. I, don't know what, I don't know what your dad was listening to, but yeah. my dad is a straight up baby boomer, yeah. so he was <laughs> listening to a lot of stuff in the late fifties, early sixties. Yeah, so you know that sort of thing. Fifties yeah. doo wop, right? Yeah, more <laughs> or less. But this movie is really a pretty novel take on the traditional going back in time and reliving your past life trope, so to speak. It's 
the, the plot itself is actually pretty straightforward. I mean, you have John Cusack. He lives with his nephew, who is kind of a basement dweller a little bit. Not a, not a really toxic one, but <laughs> yeah, he's a basement dweller nonetheless. I, I think we all know someone like yep. that. You have Craig Robinson, who is kind of a cuck, I want to say here. <laughs> he's, a, he's totally cuckolded here. And then you have Rob Corddry's character, Lewis, who is just still a straight-up party guy. He's the same guy he was back in high school. You know what I mean? Never changed. Never the, changed. The party. He never left the party, I guess. <laughs> Would you say that he peaked in high school, maybe? Probably, for sure. I keep trying to wrap my head around the fact that they implied that originally he banged his mom, right? So he didn't remember banging his mom? I, I guess not, you know. Banging uh, the kid's mom, I mean, his, his best friend, Adam's sister. His, his best friend's sister. It's like, yeah. I, I would remember that, right? Because <laughs> <Like, laughs> then I'd go and tell you about it. <laughs> yeah, you would think so. I mean, th this is supposedly like 20 years in the past, right? Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things I've always wondered about these type of movies. I mean, wouldn't they have some memory of any of this previous to this? I mean, how does this type of time loop work? Yeah, I mean... Well, no, this is time travel where their pre-existing realities still exist. There's this mutable time travel, so probably alternate reality time travel. Hmm. That's interesting. Alternate reality time travel. So basically, it's another tangent of time, more or less. Well, like okay. Time travel movies fall into three categories. There's usually three types of time travel in fiction. You have immutable time travel or the, the bootstrap paradox, right? Time loops. You have mutable time travel, which is subject to the grandfather paradox. Think like back to the future. He can go back in time and prevent his existence. And then there is, of course, alternate reality time travel where create an alternate reality. So actually, I take that back. This is mutable because they have the possibility to undo his birth. So there you go. That, that's my time travel rant. It, it's, it's not alternate reality. It's, it's mutable, mutable time travel. That's interesting, and that seems about right here. I mean, like I said, this is a movie that is pretty novel in its approach to time travel. Especially the way that they actually work around the whole, you know, meeting yourself in the past trope. They they, they actually just made these uh, characters their past selves, which I thought yeah. was actually kind of ingenious a little bit. I mean, some would probably argue that it's like plot armor or something like that. But I mean, I, I think that it's actually a decent way to kind of work around that, you know? Yeah. Work around uh, running into yourself and destroying the whole world. Yeah, because, I mean, that that's a trope that's as old as time travel stories themselves, more or less, right? Back to future theories. Yeah. Yeah. They replace their younger selves, and to each other, they look like their adult selves, but to everyone else, they're young. Yes. And I, I guess physically, they're young. Yeah. But, I mean, the comedy of this movie itself, I mean... Just the way that it plays off of the whole 80s vibe is really, really cool to me. Right, Robert? The, the moment that they go skiing after yeah. the night in the hot tub, I mean, it's really, really, you know, it's, it's, it's not obvious or like right off the bat. But then just as, every, as, as you start to look around a little more and you start to, you know, see how everybody is dressed, and then it's like, oh... Okay. And then that moment where Craig Robinson is just like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What color is Michael Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing, honestly. That's what I thought. But, I mean, that was a really, really interesting way that they utilized the 80s vibe. I mean, it kind of felt like an 80s movie, but it didn't feel like an 80s movie. Kind of like uh, John Cusack's other skiing movie, what, Better, Not, Better Off Dead or something? What, the uh, skiing the, the K-13 or something? Yeah, I yeah. think I remember that movie. The I K-12 mean, or something? <laughs> yeah, the K-12. I mean, wasn't that movie called K-12? Or uh, was, was that the mountain called, climbing movie? called Better Off Dead. It is. You know, oh, yeah, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. When driving his Camaro around, his bitchy Camaro. But let's go ahead and talk a little bit about, you know, the story of this movie, the characters and whatnot. I mean, the guy's went on this trip pretty much because of kind of a pretty dark reason, actually. Lewis, Rob Corddry's character, he 
ends up trying to kill himself, and he's initially denying that he actually was trying to kill himself. But, you know, he survived, thankfully. And, you know, the, the guys just pretty much decided, hey, why don't we just go back to our place of our youth and let's have some fun. So they organize this trip and they decide to go skiing. And, you know, this was where this Winterfest 86 happened back in the day. They, they even find evidence of it with the whole, you know, message in that drawer and everything. Uh-huh. So... I would totally do that for y'all guys. I mean, I don't know what y'all would do for me, man. I mean, I, I would, I, I would totally go on a trip for you guys. Yeah, I would, that would be it. badass. I mean, we that gotta, get, we gotta get out of this town sometime. Yeah, sometimes we gotta get the fuck out of here. You know, <laughs> get, get the collateral cinema bus. Yeah, let, let, let's get our own bus. I mean, may, maybe we need to start touring whenever the pandemic breaks. You know what, yeah. Y'all, y'all are my assholes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Well, y- you're, you're our dick. <laughs> Yeah, which is a weird concept in and of itself, but... He is because yeah. we're the two balls. Yeah, yeah we, we're the two balls, and he's in the center <laughs> right here. That, that, that's kind of what's going it's on. Am I, am I the pole that's being waxed? We're sandwiched in between them, so kind of like a pair of dick and balls. Yeah, it kind of feels that <laughs> way a little bit. I mean, once again, it's great to be under the same roof again recording. Oh, yeah. You know, no, no Skype here. Nope, mm-hmm. this is 100% pure our voices. Straight up, yeah, this is our voices... Well, I mean, Robert and I, it's been our voices this whole time. Yeah, it doesn't sound like he's Stephen Hawking. He doesn't sound like he's Stephen Hawking anymore. <laughs> there, there yeah, <laughs> it's disappointing. <laughs> but, yeah, Kodiak Valley is portrayed as one of those really, really rowdy ski towns. I mean, what state is this supposed to take place in? Is this in Colorado? Is this in, I, I mean. No idea. Is it around Aspen or something like that? Aspen, I mean, Colorado. It's, maybe it is, right? Now. Yeah, I mean, it kind of feels Seems like it would be a Colorado vibe to it you know yeah I, I definitely see that but i mean it seems like the type of place to go and hang out and i can see why the guys would actually go there and i could see why they would have this rowdy winter fest like i remember back when mtv did their own little like uh winter fest in colorado and like in aspen and whatnot I, I, fr- I think it was called Snowcore or something like that. Or it was like a tour or something. But it was basically a uh, alt-rock metal concert that toured around, and they played mostly like ski towns and whatnot. So it, it, at this particular concert, you have a band that is kind of a bane of my existence, though. <laughs> it, it's played rather well by a tribute band, but... It's poison, and it's like, why poison? <laughs> why? <laughs> the rip-off Molly Crew? Yeah, yeah, the poor man's Motley Crew. Why man's. are we doing poison? Couldn't we have gotten Great White or something like that? I or mean, White Snake? White Any, Snake? Anything, or, dude. Shit, I mean, fucking goddamn White Tiger, for fuck's sake, or Maybe something some like that. Yesterday and today, Wine Tiger. <laughs> Maybe some no, poor. fucking, <laughs> fucking Dokken, man. Some get get Dokken. Riot. Some uh, Riot, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's just a band that, uh, it, it, it pisses me off because they're just a no-talent-having band. I don't know how the <laughs> hell they even became a thing. Because, because of Molly Crew. Because of Molly Crew, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, I remember that MTV Video Music Awards where C.C. DeVille just crashed and burned. Like, I mean, it was just tragic to watch. I mean, he was just so fucked up, and he was just failing at playing guitar. And it's like... It's like that joke from Metalocalypse. It's like you actually unlearned how to play the guitar. It's like, how the fuck does that happen? D- Dave Mustaine. <laughs> Dave Mustaine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dave Mustaine can barely play, believe it or not. Or at least that's what we believe. Yeah, yeah but... I mean, that, it's there. The evidence is there. The evidence is there, but that's a that's a conversation for another time. I'm sure there, there's some motherfuckers that are going to come up into our comment section and just be like, how did you ever listen to Peace Cells all the way through? It's like, yeah, we have, dude. It's like, I mean, come on. <laughs> come on now. It, it, Dave Mustaine was never going to overcome Metallica. Even later, David, David Mustaine. Nope. It's only a mad time. Matter of time before Kirk Hammett got there. But the time machine itself is kind of interesting. Like, I like the idea of using a hot tub as a means of traveling back in time. And it's given an interesting kind of explanation. It's, although it's almost kind of MacGuffin-y a little yes. bit. <laughs> you know what I mean, Ash? No. <laughs> it's what 
tri- trilithia or some shit. It's some weird ingredient in this uh, Russian Chernobyl drink that uh, Lewis Chernobyl. brings. Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Yeah. yeah. A Russian Red Bull, pretty much. Yeah, it's Russian Red Bull. Like, they were literally going to do fucking bull blasters with Russian Red Bull. <laughs> you, cra- you crazy motherfuckers. My God. And that gets poured in the gadgetry for the hot tub and... By accident, yeah. they get they go back in time into the flux capacitor. <laughs> yeah, where is the flux capacitor on this fucking? With one point twenty one gigawatts. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! But yeah, I thought that it was an interesting device to use to get the guys back in time. You know, because it's a central point to what they're doing. There, they're there to party. You know, they're there to, you know, kind of re- relax and unwind. And what better way than to do that with a hot tub? I mean, I don't think they even knew that they had one there, which is interesting because I don't remember them ever mentioning that there was a hot tub there before. No. no. So is the hot tub like a new addition to their room? I think it is, right? It has to be. It has to be, right? Yeah. I mean, otherwise they would have remembered it. It's like that wasn't there before. But... No, it wasn't. I mean, that, that, that's kind of what I'm figuring here is that, I mean, that's just something that wasn't there before. And, you know, just for reasons, you know, the plot, the plot it just, requires it, the plot requires it. It just appears. <laughs> yeah. But I'd like to also remark on Chevy Chase's character here in, in like he's a very novel approach to the time travel guide type of character. Right. He's so ambiguous, and he never really does make it 100% clear. He just keeps saying bullshit. (laughs) It seems to me like he actually knows what he's talking about, right? Yeah, he's basically the the Doc Brown in this situation. Yeah, he's he's the Doc Brown, exactly. So who's the Marty McFly? I guess all four of them. All four of them the Marty (laughs) McFly? All four of them. And incidentally, there is a McFly in this movie, right? And the DeLorean is the hot tub. And the DeLorean is the hot tub. There is a McFly in this movie, right? Yes, there is. Crispin Glover. Crispin Glover himself, yeah. He plays the bellhop, and he's part of another really fun running gag with the severed arm bit. I thought that was actually well done. I mean, that was actually one of my favorite gags in the entire movie. Right, because you keep expecting his arm to go off. And it's like, why does he keep putting himself in these situations where his arm is going to go off? And, and you realize, yeah, this has to be the moment where his arm goes off. And then they just they just keep that gag going. <laughs> and it's hilarious how close it gets. And then it finally happens. <laughs> unexpectedly (laughs) yeah it happens in the best way possible because at first you get a fake out yeah and then it's pretty much it once it happens it's pretty much the exact same thing that was faked out before i mean it's kind of perfect how it works out and it's also perfect how they show the other incidences where you think that he's going to lose his arm but i mean he doesn't it's it's kind of ingenious how they do that like it's like straight up final destination stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like a parody <laughs> of final de- destination. Exactly. The elevator. Yeah, that elevator one. It's like, no, that actually reminded me of the beginning of the Resident Evil movie, the very first one. Mm-hmm. Like, except that that was a lady's head, though. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But the time machine itself, I mean, there's no explanation for how it really works. I mean, Adam, the who, who's the actor again that plays the the, the kid? Adam Clark it, Clark Duke Clark Duke. Yes, yeah. I mean he kind of explains it a little bit, and it's kind of along the lines of how Ash explained it. Yeah, they they don't really get into it, and this movie isn't the kind that needs to get into it. The time travel exists. There's a bare bones explanation applied for it, and that's it. From there on, we just it's the movie as it is. <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting how the time machine actually works because, I mean, it, it kind of makes me wonder. It's like, was this going to work one way or the other? And maybe just uh, dropping the Chernobyl on it just, you know, I, I don't know. It, it maybe just fucked up the time machine even worse than before or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it messed it up and you had to fix it. Chevy Chase had to fix it again. Yeah. And yeah. They, they had a report again on there. Yeah. Oh, Chevy Chase, he's so great once again. Yeah, but. I mean, it pretty much requires them to all be in the hot tub, and they're all pretty much wasted off of their ass. Yeah. And and, and the morning after when they wake up is fucking superb. <laughs> fucking goddammit, Lewis, he fucking vomits on a fucking squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that same squirrel the one that shows up to fuck up the John Elway's drive? Yep. <laughs> yep. yep. Ruins the bet. 
yeah. hilarious. You know, further evidence that this is in Colorado right there. It's like you have a Denver game and it's going on at the, the actual Denver Stadium. Yeah. There we go. So, yeah, yeah, this is clearly in Colorado. And just I, I like the montage when the time machine is working. You know, they're all just having fun. They're drinking. There's all these flashes of different characters that come in out of nowhere. There's, I think there's some random breasts that appear out of nowhere. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Ronald Reagan's face. Ronald Reagan's face, exactly. I think they're wearing Reagan masks yeah. at one point, aren't they? Point break masks. All, all point break style. And then they just wake up, and it's 1986, and they, and they don't even really figure it out until they go out skiing. And, of course, you know, Clark Duke, his character has a snowboard, and, you know, there weren't snowboards back then. You know, I think that was more of a 90s thing. So they question it. They question it. They certainly do. Yeah, yeah, the ski patrol, which, by the way, is pretty much every 80s movie villain wrapped up into one. And it's played by Sebastian Stan. Yeah, which is perfect, <laughs> right? And. I mean, I was expecting them to have a cardigan fucking wrapped around their waist or some shit, you know? <laughs> Freaking Cobra Kai dudes. Cobra Kai style, yeah, yeah. Cobra Kai. They, yeah, they were pretty much Cobra Kai style. And, and they're going through their personal effects thinking that they're goddamn commie spies. And it's like, God damn it, 1986. Of course you would think that. After watching yeah. Red Dawn, you're going to think that? Right? Yeah. Yeah, th this motherfucker is straight up just watching Red Dawn on repeat. <laughs> and, and it's just forcing him to take this approach that these are like these goddamn communist spies. And they, they even think that the Chernobyl is a goddamn, like, soda can bomb. <laughs> America! America. And, and they even have a goddamn smartphone. It's like... I mean, which it would be alien technology. like, yeah. would, and, and it's kind of pointed out that, you know, one guy, he has one of those ancient, you know, big-ass brick cell phones. Yeah. You know? He's like, hey, Bob, guess what? I'm calling you on a mountain. On my phone. On my phone. Cordless. It's like, I mean, this movie has a good little nostalgia vibe to it as far as the 80s uh, backdrop is concerned, right? Uh-oh. Crispin Glover. Crispin Glover. Oh, shit. Yeah, here's the chainsaw scene. Yeah, you think you're going to get the payoff, but oh, you don't get it. What? And that's what's good about this movie is that it pays off a lot of its jokes. And yes. it pays it off in a way that's satisfying. Yeah. You know, I, I love the buildup with this joke, for instance, over the course of the film. I love the, the running gag. Yeah. It's so perfect. And, and, and when you're actually introduced to Crispin Glover, he's such a miserable asshole because he lost his arm and everything. But... He finally kind of gets a little bit of justice in the end, and he actually retains his arm, which is actually <laughs> really fucking cool. You you feel good for the guy. It's like, hey, he, he's he's not an amputee. Wow. It's like they were able to reattach it. That actually made me feel good. And it, it ends in a way that, you know, is maybe a little predictable, but is also pretty, you know, good vibe, you know? Well... I don't know if it's predictable because it's a pretty interesting ending. I mean, they just jump into a, an alternate reality that they have no clue about. And that's yeah. their new lives. And, and that's yeah. their new, yeah. Yeah, they have Crazy. no idea what the fuck happened. Like John Cusack, he ends up with that uh, journalist lady that was traveling with poison. Ooh, nice. You know? He did good. Yeah. And, of course, you know, Craig Robinson, he scared his wife into not cheating on him at a very young age in 1986. But that scene is fucking hilarious where he is just like, did, did you lick his balls? Did, did you eat his ass or something like that? <laughs> and he's saying this to a nine-year-old girl. And, and, his, and yes. oh, <laughs> my Lord. And this, this poor girl is sitting there mortified. She's like, oh my God. like this, just, just terrified. And, and, of course, you know, I, I love the whole joke with her dad. Everything is just like, this doesn't concern you, Jerry. <laughs> Hang up the fucking phone. Like, that's so perfect, right? Yeah, yeah, that, it, that's really funny. Now, what ties into that is Lou's mission ultimately to stay behind and change the past. Like, at first he kind of exploits it. Like with the aforementioned Denver Broncos drive. It was, yeah. it was a legendary drive where Elway, you know, like, like there was minutes left and Elway got the Broncos downfield and they scored a touchdown. But, you know, causality causes that to fuck itself all to shit, needless to say. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's kind of funny how that actually starts to play into their time in the 80s. Like, 
they actually do start subtly changing certain things in the past. And yeah, because they make sure to because the whole main plot in the film for, for I guess a good half of it is them trying to recreate the past exactly as it was so that they don't change anything so that, you know, the kids still gets born and yeah. everything plays out the way it was supposed to. So they're, they're struggling to meet these objectives, but, you know, e- even subtle things are changing along the way. Yeah, I mean, they're not having zero effect on anything, really. I mean, she breaks up with Adam, right? Yeah, that's a major change that happens. And also there's, you know, the fact that, you know, spoiler alert, Lewis is Adam's father, which is actually a really hilarious way how they come around to that. Yes. (laughs) Oh, my God. That I I kind of predicted that would happen earlier on in the movie, but it it just paid off so perfectly. Like right at that moment of realization, we're like, oh, shit. Yeah, no, he is his dad. (laughs) So like it makes sense now. It makes perfect sense, especially especially the way that they actually interact with each other. They hate each other. (laughs) They absolutely despise each other. And that makes sense. It's like, of, of course, Adam would fucking hate his dad. He doesn't know his dad up to that point. Basically a bastard. Basically, but it's cool how that works out in the end as well, you know? Like, I mean, him and Kelly are actually, they're actually perfect for each other. I mean, because, I mean, Kelly's attitude and Lewis's attitude, I mean, they just complement each other, right? Yeah. It's a perfect couple. And it also kind of fits Adam as a character, you know, as far as having parents. It's like, of course he would have parents like that. Yeah. (laughs) Because he's he's a total snarky kid himself. You know, he's he's snarky and a half. John Cusack's just cool uncle. You got a good family. Yeah, you got a good family, right? Yeah, fucking John Cusack. So poison, poison. Look, there's Dakota <laughs> up front. No, that's Molly Crew. We haven't. Have any of y'all even seen the the second Hot Tub Time Machine? No, no, no I haven't seen the second movie. I'm kind of curious as to how they actually yeah. continue the storyline there you know they go to the future so it's basically back to the future 2 essentially it is yeah it's back to the future 2 right yeah but it it's it would be interesting to see how they get the hot tub time machine back and working like do they go back to Kodiak yeah they do they they do that's, that's what i saw in some of the trailers I would like to think that, you know, Lewis probably bought the fucking lodge that they were staying at, you yeah, know? Yeah, that's my money pit right there. That's my Yeah. Money. Yeah, and just be like, yeah, by the way, I could go anywhere in time and fuck with anything. So long as he has enough of that Chernobyl, right? Yeah. I don't know where the hell he got that. Well, I mean, if he's rich, he could probably get it through illegal channels. I yeah, mean, it's, yeah. spo- it's supposed to be an illegal drink in America, yeah. so I'm I'm sure he has his ways. I mean, I don't even know how the fuck he got the cans that he had before. <laughs> I mean, who the fuck smuggled that shit in? I mean, there's all kinds of contraband that smuggled into our country, but how the fuck did he get a hold of Russian fucking energy drinks with weird nuclear-sounding... Uh, ingredients <laughs> like what the fuck <laughs> nitro nitro tr- trinidium <laughs> nitro trinidium <laughs> i don't know what it is <laughs> in, in a typical you know like party movie fashion this movie doesn't a- attempt to hold itself seriously or take anything so literally i mean for instance do you did you notice how the band just knew how to play black eyed peas yeah, that that's kind of ripped straight from Back to the Future when you really think about it. I mean, yeah, that that's the whole, you know, Johnny B. Good scene. I mean, h- how did they know to play that song if that hadn't been written and recorded and released yet? Exactly. And then at the end, well, what's funny is midway through the movie, they mentioned Motley Crue existing at that time. But then at the end, they reveal that he started Motley Lou. <laughs> Motley Lou, yeah. It, it's like, what is the deal with that? And is is that Motley Crue? It's just Motley Lou? Because at the end, they pretty much superimpose Rob Corddry all over Vince Neil in that particular music video. And, you know, you see Tommy Lee, you see Mick Mars, you know, you, you see them. You see all of them. Dude, that is funny. Nikki Six and all that. But, I mean, yeah, what's the deal with that? Is is he in Motley Crue or is that a different band? I'm, I'm confused now, I think, legitimately. I think Vince Neil never happened, right? That, that would have to be. Yeah, he had to have gone in and stole Vince Neil's thunder yeah, somehow. That's what happened. All, all I'm saying is they mentioned Motley Crue existing. I mean, yeah. Motley Crue existed in 1986. Obviously, yeah. 
So it, it's just odd to me that he would change that if they were already a pre-existing band, unless oh. he u- continued to use the time machine and he used it more than once. You're right. That's probably the most likely scenario right there. Molly Crew weren't even a thing till 1981, 82. A typical road trip weekend consists of partying, hooking up, and going wild. But in 2010, four friends will discover a new level of awesome. Go. All right. Look, 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 what are we going to do? You guys are terrible at quarters? Let's break into a school or uh, steal a cop car or something, huh? Do you have Ritalin? What? Guys, come look at this. You don't think it's a little weird, a bunch of guys just piling up in a big bathtub together? It's called male bonding, okay? Haven't you even seen Wild Hogs? Watch out, here I come. Come. What the hell happened last night? Is there some kind of retro thing going on this weekend? There's something going on in here. Dude is rocking cassette player. Leg warmers. I'm sure there's a good explanation for all this. Jerry, good on. Excuse me, miss. What color is Michael Jackson? Black. Manifest 86. I don't understand how we back in time. I'm so scared. Must be some kind of hot tub time machine. This March, this is a very special model that you have here. You know exactly what's going on here, don't you, old man? <laughs> Come on, it's the 80s. Let's do what we want. Free love. Hey, let's get this party started. Mom? Forget the present. <laughs> Why did I ever pick up with it? What was I thinking? Wow. And now the universe is giving me another shot. This is going to be the best weekend, like, ever. Mm. 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 I feel pregnant. Change the future. There's money to be made here, man. We could invent iPods, Prius, Match.com, short rims. We could combine uh, Viagra with Twitter. What? Twitagra. Boom! And kick some past. You're breaking up with me? That's not how this happens. Do you know what happens to you? When you get fat. I mean, like, fat. Oh! Hot tub time machine. Could I text you later? Wait, what? Are you online at all? I have no idea what you're saying. How do I get a hold of you? Come find me. That just sounds exhausting. Yeah, so they had already been a band and started becoming really, really big by 86. Like that, that was probably at the height of their career. So there's honestly. no way he could have changed that in 1986. You're no. Right. No, yeah. he had to have gone back in time again. Yeah. That's the only thing. And that's why I feel like in the second movie, and ladies and gentlemen, if you've seen the movie, please don't spoil it for us. I mean, yeah, yeah. we spoil lots of things for you. We're going to find it. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll probably do another episode. Yeah, we'll probably do another episode next season on the sequel and everything. But I'm very curious how they you know, get back to the time machine, like what's in the future for them to actually change or to manipulate. Like that that's kind of interesting. I'd like to see what happens. Yeah, and I guess the sequel is kind of a, almost a reunion film, although it's just what, four years later? Yeah, it's four years after the original. And I don't think there's John Cusack in it. I think it's some other guy from uh Step Brothers. Really? John Cusack isn't in the sequel? I don't really? think he is. I, I didn't see him in there. Well I am to be that later. Yeah, we'll have to go take a look at that. But why is it that John Cusack speaking of the devil, why does he play the same character in every movie? I don't know. <laughs> just because he's John Cusack. You know? Yeah, it's it's like you just know exactly what you're getting with one of his movies. You're getting John fucking Cusack. He, he plays himself. Pretty yeah, much. yeah. He's not playing, you know, John Cusack as anyone. It's just John Cusack. John Cusack. Well, <laughs> if you cast Adam Sandler, I mean, you're just casting Adam Sandler. That's true. That's very true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there there's a lot of actors that are like that, and that's kind of a... Uh, an old Hollywood thing going all the way back to the golden age, you know? Just being yourself, really. Like, like a good example of that is John Wayne. May he fuck himself. James <laughs> Dean. James, James Dean. Dean? Yeah, true. Yeah. You know, Owen Wilson is a lot like he is in the movies. Yeah, you're right. He is. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's pretty much the same character. Yeah. But yeah, John Cusack is just the same guy in all of his movies. I mean, what's a good example of one of his characters that, you know, fits this character? 
Probably the fourteen oh eight movie tutor. Oh yeah, his his role in fourteen oh eight. Yeah, yeah, he kind of has that same kind of bland, you know, n- kind of nonplussed look to him a little bit. You know what else? Maybe maybe uh twenty twelve right? Twenty oh yeah exactly. A little, little, bit, little bit after this movie. <laughs> yeah exactly. Fucking twenty twelve that movie. <laughs> I don't know. We might have to do that eventually on the podcast because oh that's such a travesty. Like both as a conspiracy theory and as a movie. Yes. It's it's just an absolute fucking travesty. But, I mean, didn't John Cusack also play in that movie where he held the boombox over his head? Yeah. And what was the name of that movie? I forgot. It's another 80s chick flick Cusack movie. Yeah, total Cusack movie. Like, I mean, it's almost kind of John Hughes-ish, right? Yeah. He drove around like a, a Chevy. Or a yeah, and he acted like a total stalker in that movie. So, yeah. You yeah. know. With a trench coat and a yeah. boombox. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot of characters like that in the fucking 80s. You yeah, know, I mean, like a Breakfast Club. Oh, totally Breakfast Club. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fucking Molly Ringwald, dude. Oh, the arm, the arm scene. Oh, there's the, yeah, there's this arm scene with the elevator. We've yeah. seen like three arm scenes already. I know, right? There's, <laughs> there's all, it seems like every time I'm looking over here, it's another scene with Crispin Glover. <laughs> Hilarious. So we, we skipped over Back to the Future. To do this movie first. Yeah, we could have gone with Back to the Future if we wanted a time travel movie. And that's a real classic. Yeah. I mean. Love that movie. Yeah. Let's not, you know, parse words there. I mean, that's a great movie. And we will do that movie on this podcast soon. I think it's our first time travel movie besides Endgame. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Endgame, though, like, wow, that time travel was convoluted. I... I, I can make sense of it. Yeah. I, I, I'm okay with it. It, it. It's all actually theoretically consistent. You just have to think a little deeper about it. But we'll, we'll, we'll be able to compare this with the time travel that is in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. That's our next episode, right? Yeah, that should be our next episode. Unless, yes. unless I decide to do Toxic Avenger next. Oh, <laughs> with, oh. with special guest Michael Cornwell. Michael oh. Cornwell. Yeah, we may as well go ahead and announce that right now. Michael Cornwell from the Country Club on the show. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, <laughs> man. Finally, we'll get Homeboy on the on this show. We tried to get him on the Suicide Squad episode. I don't remember if we tried to get him on any other episode, but yeah, man, it's, it'll be good to have Michael on the show and talking about Toxic Avenger, you know, the quintessential classic trauma movie. And, and it's going to be our second trauma movie as well. Have you seen Toxic Avenger, Ash? No, I haven't. Oh, you haven't seen Melvin slip into a batch of chemicals and slip become into a batch of chemicals. He's thrown into a batch of chemicals. He, he falls from the damn school <laughs> into a tub and, of a batch of chemicals. We're doing this instead of Sergeant Kabuki Man. Yeah, we were going to do Sergeant Kabuki Man, but once I got a copy of Toxic Avenger, I was just like, no, we got to do Toxic Avenger. We we have to do Toxie first. Like Kabuki Man is kind of a a side character to Toxie, anyways. You know, yeah. they, they even interact in a few movies, so... Toxic Avenger was before Class of Newcomb High. Yeah, totally. So... Yeah, doesn't Toxie show up in one of the Newcomb High movies? Yeah, he appears even in the posters, even just in the background sometimes. <laughs> well, here we are already getting into this goddamn movie without Michael. God damn it. Well, it, it'll be good, too, because my introduction to this podcast, one of the first episodes I was on was Hectic Knife. Yeah, that's right. It was one of the indie reviews we did for our first trauma movie. Yeah. Besides the commentary on the room, that was that was the first episode I was on. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's your first introduction to the Potter family and and to the Tromaverse. And to the Tromaverse, exactly. Motherfucking Tromaville, man. But how do you guys feel about the comedy throughout the Hot Tub Time Machine? More or less, you know, just in general, just the overall tone of the humor and everything. Buddy comedy? It's very much a buddy comedy, but yeah. I'm just talking, you know, content-wise, how it flows and everything. Just a uh, random improv humor, you know? just There's a lot of improv scenes here, it well, feels like. What is it? Um, Just more witty humor and just more selling it that way, you know? Yeah. Like, for instance, there's that one instance where they're all putting their fists together and they're going to be like, okay, on three... One, two, three, and then they do Hot Tub Time Machine, but uh, like Lewis messes up. He's just, oh, and then they're just like, oh, oh wait, yeah, that, that, that's the thing we're going to do from now on. It's Hot Tub. <laughs> it's like, that sounds completely improvised right there. Yeah. And that is actually a genuinely funny moment. 
Like, yeah, we might as well get into what our favorite and most funniest moments from this movie is. Like, Ash, what do you think? I, I, I think the whole scene where he bets on the dude's wife giving him a blowjob, but then, you know, the other end of that bet is his buddy's got to give him a blowjob. <laughs> <laughs> or he's got to give his buddy a blowjob. And so, I mean, just the hilarity of it and just the, the utter, like, realization <laughs> Yeah, that's that's hilarious, man. And he wakes up with soap all over his mouth, thinks it's calm. Yes. <laughs> oh my lord, that is so messed up. I mean, I I don't know. I would totally probably fuck with my <laughs> that as well, maybe. But I mean, oh my god, that that scene is outrageous. Like I said before, I really like the scene where. Uh, Craig Robinson, or Nathan, I think his name was, right? Nathan or something like that. He calls his ex-wife as a, as a kid and everything. Yeah, that's the one of the best parts. And, of yes. course, you know, we also mentioned the Crispin Glover arm running gag. But I really liked just the overall, you know, party vibe of everything, you know? It's good party humor. And it, and it doesn't, you know, exactly. get too incredibly crude all the time. It's, no. a, it's a lot like the Hangover movies. It's like, what's going to happen next, right? Yeah. It's not so much meant to be a gross-out movie. It's meant to be very much a narrative-driven type of humor, you know? It, it, it's kind of meant to keep the story flowing. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm really trying to think what some of my other favorite scenes from this movie was. And I would have to say pretty much... Any time Kelly is on screen is hilarious. And, oh, fuck yeah. And, and it's, it's actually really cool that she is tied into the main narrative and becomes, uh, you know, I mean, that, that is Adam's mom and everything. You know, the whole conceit with Lou being his father. I mean, I thought that that was really, really funny, man. Like, that was hilarious. Yeah, I, I got to say that's one of the smartest moments in the movie. Just, just the way that it's written. And, and that scene and, and the moment of realization and you, the viewer, understand it just as the character is understanding it. Thought that was done very well. Yeah, it was. Robert, what are some of your favorite scenes from this movie? What do you think was like the funniest scene in the movie? Man, they're, they're all too funny, man. Um, they really are. I, I think just watching Crispin Glover's character the whole time. Yeah, I concur. And, and just watching what he goes through. Right? Yeah, it, it's a great fucking running joke i mean what can you say what else yeah what else <laughs> I, don't, I don't know it's just dude it's hilarious i don't mind watching it you know over again. i mean Look. one thing that i will admit about the movie is that you know the first act kind of is a little slow going a little bit you know but once you actually get to the trip to kodiak, kodiak, valley, kodiak valley once you actually get to kodiak valley and once you get past the actual you know party initially i mean it really kicks into high gear and, you know, anytime Blaine is featured in the movie is also really hilarious, I think. Yeah. You know, like I said, quintessential 80s villains, you know, really preppy, <laughs> white, uppity. Johnny Lawrence. Straight up Johnny Lawrence. Yeah, yeah he's a goddamn patriot. He's a goddamn patriot, you know, straight up Reaganomics and everything. <laughs> you know, all that shit. That's right. Trickle down economics. Yay. Totally Let, works. Let's ignore the AIDS crisis. Yay. Yeah. yeah that, the fucking 80s. They even reference that, right? It's like this has Reagan. This decade has Reagan and AIDS. Let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Straight up Reagan and AIDS. Like, yeah, that's that's reason enough to get the fuck out of the 80s. Maybe, you know? maybe the 80s weren't as fond as some people like remember it to be. Yeah, there's... A lot of 80s nostalgia that I think is just as misplaced as a lot of the boomer nostalgia for the 50s a little bit. I mean, hell, I'm not even going to pretend like the 90s were even that particularly perfect or anything. Nickelodeon. You know? uh -huh. Nick and I. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the television was on point. I mean, yeah. what can I say? A lot of cultural touchstones were on point. but Goosebumps. You know, I mean, the 90s wasn't really perfect, you know, but the 80s. Oh, God, the 80s. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually old enough to have been a kid through most of the 80s. So, I mean, I can remember He-Man. I can remember all that shit, you know, Thundercats, G.I. Joe, that shit. Alf. Alf. Fucking Alf, dude. <laughs> Alf was my jam, bro. Motherfucking Alf. Right, right Pookie? Fucking Alf. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually have someone in studio with us, my, our friend Pookie. Yeah, he's in the back. He says hello to everybody. Yeah, he says he watched the movie, and it's great. Yeah, lo lots of positive vibes there, man. There's the squirrel. Yeah. 
now would be a good time to go ahead and start kind of wrapping things up and giving our final thoughts on the movie so robert since you chose this movie go ahead and give us your final thoughts you know i think it's an all-around good movie and the humor you now the random humor and it's you know it's well scripted and well improvised and I, i'd recommend it watching it to anyone else too right? what do you guys think man yeah it, it, it's a lot of fun it really is it's a great movie to watch drunk. It's a great movie to watch high. Yeah. What are your What are your final thoughts, Ash? What do you think? Um. Yeah. Just Just an overall feel good. Yeah. Party movie. I I think something like this we have to do every once in a while. Oh, I think I got another one we can do. Oh yeah. What? Kind of like this. Uh, Land of the Lost. Ooh, Land of the Lost. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Will Ferrell movie. Will Ferrell one. Yeah, that'd be pretty funny. I'm gonna grab that one. And our 420 special is coming up soon, so we'll, we'll be able to have a little bit more fun. I, I think, the you know, we, we just did Gozu, and that was very serious, and then we just did Old Fashioned, which was just really bad. Oh, it was terrible. Oh, God. Don't watch Old Fashioned, ladies and gentlemen. On no, don't watch On that. YouTube for free, don't watch it. Yeah, on YouTube for free. Don't watch it, please. Please don't. on For free on for YouTube. Free. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you should at least watch Second Glance on YouTube. Yeah, you can watch that. Which, incidentally, we're going to go ahead and announce that right now. For Collateral Cinema Director's Cut, we're going to start featuring, at least once a month, a movie commentary for some of the more low-budget kind of, you know, underground movies that we like to feature on the Director's Cut, more or less. Like, a lot more genre movies. A lot more horror, a lot more sci-fi, a lot more older movies and everything. Yeah, like we just brought Triloquist. Download that if you can. It, no, don't download Triloquist. Download please. Just don't. <laughs> please don't. Or, no. I mean our episode so you can hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. download our episode so, so you can hear that. But Triloquist, yeah, that was terrible. No, don't, don't download uh, buy it. that. But no, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it, ladies and gentlemen. Please, please don't fucking do it. Um, yeah, but, I mean, Land of the Lost, that's a good movie. We're going to do that one. We're going to do that we're one. We're going to have as much fun time as we're but having right now. the director's cut commentary is going to be Second Glance. That's that's why I brought it up. It's going to be Second Glance featuring David A.R. White, who liked our tweet earlier. Thank you very much, sir. Very kind of you. <laughs> and it's going to be interesting. It'll be something a little different, right? Daniel. Daniel, <laughs> we, we know what you've been doing, Daniel. We know what you've been doing. L l let's save that for the fucking, <laughs> for the commentary, because, oh, my God, that character is so hilarious. Hey, Scotty. Jesus, man. Jesus. Jesus, man. Yeah. Oh, man, I can't wait to do that. That is going to be uh, next week that's going to come out. But as for my final thoughts for a Hot Tub Time Machine, it's a movie that, you know, I've always kind of sort of skimmed over you know more or less I, I didn't really give it a whole lot of thought but now that i've seen it i'm glad that you know we were able to do this on the podcast you know because i mean you need a good old-fashioned kind of comedy like this that's just kind of light-hearted has some risque humor to it and everything i mean we we did watch the unrated version there was like some nudity there there was a lot of you know, a, a lot of language and whatnot, Titties. drug use. And there's some drug use even. But, I mean, it never went too heavy with any of those themes. It was pretty clean. Yeah. yeah. Even Lewis, who is meant to be the asshole of the group, I mean, he's, you know, still a very fun-loving guy. I mean, he's very likable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the characters themselves are likable. I really like that. Even John Cusack, <laughs> who was as, just playing John Cusack. As John Cusack. 
I mean, but even he's made to be very likable. I mean, nobody here is really shown as, you know, being irredeemably as much of an asshole as, you know, they want you to think in this movie. Like, like for instance, John Cusack, his girlfriend, who we never actually meet at the beginning of the movie, she moves out and she takes his TV, even though she clearly he clearly marked it, you know? It's like, thank goodness we didn't meet her for one. Yeah. But for two, he never comes across as like that throughout this entire movie. He's very likable. Yeah. You know, Craig Robinson is likable. E- even Clark Duke is likable. Like, e- even Kelly, you know, his sister back in the day Hell in the yeah. 80s. Even she's a very likable person, and she's pretty much an airheaded, you know, bimbo type. You know, valley girl all the way, that type of character. And wasn't there an actress from Mean Girls in this movie? Yeah, the girl that plays his love interest, April, is Janice Ian from Mean Girls. Man, she's she's adorable. Yeah, she was great in this movie. She played the journalist girl that was traveling with poison. I mean, Robert, what, what are your thoughts on her? Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. And as far as an actor... Oh, I, I enjoyed her Mean Girls. In fact, why don't we do that? Yeah, okay. we should totally do Mean we Girls. Totally do Mean Girls. I, I, aren't you choosing Mean Girls yeah. somewhere along the line? Some, somewhere along a, the a line, th- it, it's, th- it's a future. It's a future movie. Yeah, we we got to do Mean Girls. That is kind of a cultural touchstone, a little bit for the two thousands. And we'll be bringing back Fetch. Oh yeah. <laughs> and we're gonna record on Wednesday, and we're gonna wear pink. Oh my lord. <laughs> But yeah, if you have a chance to pick up Hot Tub Time Machine or to stream it or to check it out, yeah, check this movie out. It gets the thumbs up, seal of approval from Collateral Cinema for whatever that's worth. I, I don't know if that's <laughs> worth much of anything. Uh, Nothing on Patreon, like, no, apparently. Apparently not. Does it, get, does it get the vegan seal of approval? I don't fucking know. Yes, it does. <laughs> I don't know. That, 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 that dead raccoon didn't look particularly vegan to me. Yeah, that was veganly fresh. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was a fresh dead kill. Jesus Christ. <laughs> God damn it. All right, let's go ahead and start plugging some stuff. Ash, go ahead and plug Collateral Gaming for us. Well, we just recorded our first part of our episode on Metroid Fusion, so that should be out by the time this is out. Uh, hopefully get us back on schedule and then we're going to be doing a Metroid-focused bonus round and a part two to Metroid Fusion. And then coming up, Collateral Cinema and Collateral Gaming are going to be collaborating in celebration of the new Mortal Kombat movie. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. I mean, the trailer is out already. People mm. are talking about it. People are going crazy over the trailer. Oh, they are, man. Yeah. It looks amazing. So we're, we're finally doing an actual cross-cast, and we're going we're gonna to have an episode on both. And so we're going to do the At The Movies episode, and then we're also going to be doing a tie-in with Mortal Kombat 11 on the collateral gaming side. And, you know, both podcasts working on both together. You know what would be a fun bonus round? Have me on to talk about the original old school games. Like that, That's actually one, on the books. That's on the books. Like maybe Mortal Kombat's one through four. Yeah. Like that, that's what I consider the classic era of Mortal Kombat, you know, one through four. That's classic Mortal Kombat to me. Yeah, I have so. a bonus round that's going to be tailored towards that, and I and I, I wanted to see if you guys wanted to be on that one. I would totally love to be on that one. Robert? I'll be there. Yeah. So Hell yeah. Who doesn't want to talk about fucking Mortal Kombat, dude? <laughs> like, seriously. But yeah, that's what we have down the line for Collateral Cinema. And our next episode is going to be Harry fucking Potter, right? Harry fucking Potter, yeah. Harry motherfucking goddamn Potter. It's about time. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Rawlings a fucking turf and all, but, you know, whatever. You know, th- the work <laughs> still stands, all right? Yeah. All right. yeah Divorce well. it from the author. I, I enjoy the movies. I I heavily enjoyed the books i was a harry potter fanatic when i was a kid yeah but you, you know that i'm gonna fucking just totally rag on her the entire time that's fine by all means yeah by all means yeah i'm gonna rag on jk rowling people don't don't get too offended but yeah i'm totally gonna go there but yeah another time travel movie we'll get to kind of compare and contrast the the time travel and i i, I think it's the most interesting harry potter movie it, it, it has the best direction and aesthetic it's directed by alphonse Caron. You yeah. know, who, he is a legitimate auteur. So, you know. But, yeah, that's going to be interesting. Harry Potter is a very popular series still. You know, and, and we do hope that all the fans of the Harry Potterverse come and check us out. You know, it'll be a lot of fun. You know, it'll be a little different. Yeah. You know, a different vibe. But 
Yeah, you can find Collateral Cinema on Instagram, on Facebook, and on YouTube. And Robert, do you still have Killing Night up on the main Facebook page? It's on YouTube, and it's on my IGTV page. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah, so definitely check out Killing Night, directed by Robert Ortegon, filmed by me, and starring Robert Ortegon. Check that out. And you can find Collateral Cinema, the podcast, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio. You can find us on... What's another platform? YouTube, <laughs> YouTube. Google Podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can find us pretty much wherever you get your podcasts. So, yeah, check us out. I mean, you can find us all over. And very soon we will have not only a website, finally, we're also going to have merchandise, right? Hell yeah, it's in the works. Really, really excited about this coming together because we're going to launch merchandise for both Collateral Cinema and Collateral Gaming so you can show your support. Uh, all proceeds will go towards our podcast and not in our pockets. Um, it'll allow us to keep this running and where needed, purchase new equipment. Exactly. So anyway, with all of that said, I'm Bo Maddox. I'm Robert Oregon. I'm Ashley Chancellor. And this was Collateral Cinema. And ladies and gentlemen, hit the hot tub, man. Hit the tub. The great. Collateral Cinema is an L Company production. All music and movie clips are owned by the respective creators and are used for educational purposes only. Please don't sue us. We're poor.